I happen to be, have the honor to be on the board when he was hired <laughs> uh, quite a while ago. And I have been just, uh, as a side note, uh, so impressed with uh, the direction the Friends have gone. They've really expanded their mission in many ways. Uh, you know, they're, they've really had a focus, which happened actually during my time of uh, introducing people to this great area uh, and welcoming people of all backgrounds uh, and uh, and also uh, focused uh, on the local businesses of the area and making sure that the economy supports long-term um, uh, direction for them so great great uh, work by the organization in the last uh, years with Chris at the helm. So with that, I think I'm going to just go ahead and turn it over to you. I'll get you queued up here. All right. And, thank uh, thank you, Mark. Here. Thanks yeah. so much for having me here. Yeah, yeah. And his grandson <laughs> yeah, is here, right. too, which is Jackson, even Jackson. <laughs> the next generation here. All right. I will uh, get set up here. There. Jackson will get a, get a seat for you, and you can assist in, assist in the program here. Gotcha, situated over here. Okay. All right, we've got the PowerPoint fired up. All set. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Mark. Um, how many lakes do we have represented here? Let's say I know, I want to, John Penchorn, our uh, board member, or, uh, what what lake are you on? Seagull. Seagull Lake. Saginaw. Saginaw. Gunflint, I see here. Mm. <laughs> Loon Lake. Clearwater. Clearwater. All right, Clearwater. Poplar. Poplar. Which we missed one over here. Oh. Uh, which lake? Aspen. Aspen. All right. Any other lakes? Uh, West Erskine, Hungry Jack. All right. Oh, great. Any other lakes? Well, th this is uh, uh, so exciting. There are so many beautiful lakes in the Boundary Waters. And uh, I also want to thank Mark Hennessy for his service on the board here. And uh, John Fredersen helped us out on, on things earlier this year. Thank you so much, John. And I'm looking forward to working more with Bill here on, on things uh, on, on the Gunflint Trail here. Uh, to to kind of start off before I kind of get into the, the, the presentation, let's make a, a conversation. So feel, to, feel free to interject and we'll have a real, it's a nice uh, intimate group here. We can have a, a real, uh, real dialogue on things here. Uh, I'll start off with the vision. I'll get into some of the, the PowerPoints. But, but if you can imagine, I often, think very visually myself that that the, our, our vision as an organization that the, the canvas is the wilderness and so the the 2.7 billion billion year, billion year old granite the the towering red and white pines and the the birch trees and the the walleye and smallmouth bass and then the 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 loons and the bears and the wolves and all, all the all the wildlife that's that's sort of the canvas but but our vision requires putting people into that into that into that canvas and so taking that that backdrop and infusing it with people of all backgrounds and all ages and and all perspectives in into the wilderness and then finally the third part of our vision is that the communities that are gateways to the boundary waters are thriving and prosperous and support protection of the wilderness and so so those are our three pillars wilderness people and community and so that that informs what we do it informs how we do it and so uh, and so we're very people focused uh, as an organization we have uh, a sort of a, a network approaching 100,000 about 6,000 uh, annual paying members and all those contributors that's really the strength of our organization and so all of you that are friends of the Boundary Waters I am so incredibly grateful because that is the foundation of our success uh, as an organization uh, since 1976. And so I'll get into the, the, the presentation here. But again, I don't want this to get hung up on a PowerPoint presentation, but to really have a dialogue and connect because I'm so excited about what we're doing and where we're going. And so to kind of get us in the mood here that all these images that you're familiar with and that you've had in, in your lives, this is um, what, we, what we live for. Ah, this may not be moving forward here. Uh, let's see if we can kind of get that going. If not, you know, maybe I'll just have you kind of kind of cue it up here. There. Oh, it froze up. There we go. There, there we go. It's kind of kind of moving moving forward there, and and so 
and I know all seasons are, are, are imbued with beauty and, and really connect to our, our souls here. And, and this is sort of that emotional connection. It's, it's hard to articulate in words, but you know it. You, you really feel it. And uh, as an organization, we're bringing people of all backgrounds in, into the wilderness. I'll get more into it. But our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program connects to about 3,000 Minnesota students each year. And we, we get over, over 130 uh, students on uh, week-long wilderness canoe trips this year. And we're working uh, with Wilderness Canoe Base in Minosian on the, on the Gunflint side to do that. And of course, the, the next, the next generation here. And finally, this was Seagull Lake uh, yesterday <laughs> with my grandson Jackson. So beautiful day. You know, uh, we went out for a, a canoe trip uh, on Friday. You know, with Jackson. Well, as you know, that was not the most conducive day for paddling <laughs> with a seven-year-old in the bow and the waves on Seagull Lake and the wind. Uh, but the return trip was was quite uh, was quite beautiful here. And. Uh, and our, our roots go back far, and our roots are, are, are based in conservation, and uh, this is an important theme for us as we expand the, the meaning of conservation. It's clean water, it's land conservation, and it's climate change. I'll talk uh, about that as well as we look at how we serve the wilderness and the people that love the wilderness in the future here. And so our wilderness pillar is, is focused on advocacy and conservation. Advocacy and conservation. And that's been, uh, part of our, 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 our legacy since the 1976. But again, people is fundamental to what we do. And I've been, uh, I've, I've been in conservation for approaching 30 years now. And, and really, that, that, this is foundational. For every successful <coughs> conservation organization doesn't just focus on the sort of the birds and the trees and the rocks and the water and the fish. They really focus on people because ultimately people make decisions and it's people that end up protecting the wilderness. So just as people need the wilderness, wilderness really needs people in order for it to be protected for, for Jackson's generation here. And our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program, it has its roots in uh, one of our founders, uh, Dick Flint, started a, uh, a scholarship program to get kids of all backgrounds into the wilderness. Uh, after his uh, um, eldest son died, and so right now we kind of built on that on that foundation that Dick Flint established for us, and that is uh, our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program. And these are some of the testimonials of, of kids out here. You know, uh, I was hoping our students would conquer their fears and grow out of their comfort. Most students canoed even swam for the first time. Clues is is a is a, a group that focuses on uh, uh, St. Paul Hispanic students. But we, our, our education program works throughout the entire state. And so we are getting uh, kids from Ely out into, the, uh, out into the Boundary Waters. More than half the kids that go to Ely Public Schools have never been in the Boundary Waters. Mm -hmm. It's just extraordinary. Oh, it's extraordinary. It is just it is shocking. And so we're, we're, we work throughout the state. We're, we're in Barnum and Bemidji. We're in New Prague. We're, we're throughout, throughout the state. But that failure to connect with, with nature for, for the next generation. It, 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 it's not just urban kids, not just city kids, it's, it's really throughout. And here's a, a, a trip from just uh, three weeks ago. Ah, sound, is there, sound gonna work on that one? Mark, I don't know if it's, uh, may, maybe not. This was the, the, the uh, Clues group from St. Paul. He, he looks happy, Chris. He looks happy, I'll say there he is. <laughs> I'd say it may, may be freezing up on us. Mark, I don't know if you have any magic uh, uh, magic at the microphone there. This is the, one of those failures of technology in the, on the PowerPoints here. The, uh, so this was a, uh, a group of, of uh, we'll just, uh, looks like the video's not, not working there. Uh, but did you have a video on that last I had one? A, I had a video on that last one there, so I don't know if um, yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to put those kind of Let's see if we can get the. And I know the sound might be a little. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't. Seem yeah, th this is always that. That's always the the, the challenge. Um, kind of uh, giving. There. Oh, there's. There's. Sorry. You know, sometimes when we open these powerpoints, we need to do that little click that button for the sound. So, so it, you know, it looks like it, it's not not uh, working here, Mark. But there, but these kids were having a, a great time. And they took these videos, and they, it was a, 
uh, what it was was a series of gratitude. So all the students uh, explained what they were grateful for. They did that on their own, kind of took this sort of a, a moment of reflection and expressing their, their, their gratitude. Uh, the sort of uh, exciting thing uh, that in, uh, sort of next chapter of where we go uh, with our No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters program is that we'll be in the upcoming weeks here advertising for an education person uh, based in Grand Marais and working the Gunflint Trail, working with the, the Cook County Public Schools. So we'll have a, a, a full-time person based in Ely that will be involved in uh, education 75% of the time, primarily working with the Cook County Schools. Based in Grand Marais. Based in Grand Marais. Yeah, okay, you said Ely. Oh, did I say Ely? Oh, boy, what a faux pas. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Oh, sorry. Here, 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 here comes the you know, Bruce is going to run me out of town. Bruce is going to run me out of town. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, but to show you the, the breadth of the vision of this, so we have an education person that started in Ely in January, working up there, and has been coming over to the Cook County Schools as well. And, uh, and so we'll have a person based in Grand Marais focus on the Cook County Schools and, and expanding from there. Uh, our, our vision is that uh, what we'll have is a, a scaffolding experience where every Cook County public school student would have an, a Boundary Waters experience as they go through, this, uh, go through their educational experience from 6th through 12th grade. The idea would be that uh, all, the, all the 12th graders could have a capstone uh, Boundary Waters trip as a class. And so that we really connect connect with those uh, with those uh, students and that next generation here here locally so no boundaries to the boundary waters will be here uh, in uh, Grand Marais and the Gunflint Trail <laughs> and uh, and I know this is Ely but this is uh, <laughs> talking about the, the community pillar and we are our social animals and we come together in community just as we're coming together here at, at this community center uh, uh, the boundary the gateway communities to the Boundary Waters, their success is fundamental to the success and protection of the wilderness. And so two years ago we opened a, an office in, in downtown Ely to have conversations, to engage with the community, to be part of the community. And so that, that is, is I, I want to have those difficult conversations. The idea is not to shy away from it, not to avoid, but to have civil important conversations and that's where, where progress can be made and, and the, that common ground can be found here. And the person that will have, be based here in, uh, in Grand Marais will be doing that. So we'll be engaged with the community, being part of um, hikes, being part of uh, community events such, uh, such as the canoe races uh, on Gunflint. It's you know really uh, being part of the community dialogue and so community, people, and wilderness here. So yes, this was this was a, a, a video. Let's see. I don't know if it'll work. This is. Uh, can we can uh, you work the magic here? This was we, we took some footage of the of of, uh, of the canoe races that were up the internet. Ah, that may not be. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, it's not going to happen again. I'm always a little iffy on doing a PowerPoint and not just having a conversation. But mm -hmm. but the point is, we with North Star, we were a sponsor of the Gunflint canoe canoe races, and and uh, we want to. You know, celebration is part of community, is part of being a human being. We want to be a part of those uh, celebrations that bring people together here. Wait, oh, that you know, it's May. Yeah, just, just it, it, you know, technology. <laughs> oh, yeah, it we saw it. Was it? Was it? You know, there we, we go. don't have the sound, but we have the <laughs> footage of the fun there, and you know, kind of. You know, the, this is just a, a grand, grand time here. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that on that day, uh, July seventeenth, when I had it, I was actually coming out. I, I went from <laughs> Crane Lake to uh, to Grand Portage, and I was coming out on on the seventeenth on on, mm -hmm. on Grand Portage. <laughs> By the way, Chickwalk got fourth place. At, uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> But you did not get a medal. You know, no. That, you know. <laughs> no, no. In the Olympics, it would have been short, Mark. I mean, yeah, you yeah. know, nobody remembers the fourth place. That's just <laughs> just so we're clear on that. Oh, we do. <laughs> there we go. It's it's that's not what counts, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, talking about the the wilderness again here. There are, there are three parts I want to focus on. Uh, the first is is clean water, 
and the, the fundamental importance of that. Uh, right now, I'll get into it uh, uh, more in, in some detail, but our, our efforts to protect our clean water from the threat of sulfide mining. So we are at the forefront um, of that battle right now, and we've been very, very successful. We have basically four tools. It's uh, litigation, lawsuits, it's legislation, working to pass laws that protect clean water, and most importantly, uh, citizen action, engaging people. That's really the, the magic, is getting people to, to support the legislation that protects the clean water. And then finally, we actually, in a, an affiliate, we actually are involved in politics. I know that politics has something of a bad, bad word, but, but I actually view politicians of all backgrounds as, as real public servants. And, and I view, irrespective of, of where they're coming from, from, from the fundamental perspective that they actually, even if I disagree with them, have the best interests of, of our country in, um, in mind there. And so if you don't have that approach, then you know our kind of view of our civil society falls apart. But we are engaged with politicians because they are serving the public and it's our, our job to work with them and to direct them in a way that passes legislation that we want. And, but another part of our, 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 our wilderness work, and this is a really interesting thing, that the Superior National Forest for the probably the last decade has not had the funds and has not had the personnel. If if you if there if there were 100 acres of 120 acres, 340s, uh, at the edge of the boundary waters, that someone wanted to donate to the federal government, said, "Boy, I've had this in my family for three generations. We haven't developed it. We want to protect it for the next generation." And uh, Tom Hall, uh, the current uh, uh, supervisor for this Superior National Forest, said, "You know." I'd love to protect that. I want, we, I want that property protected. They could not accept the donation of that land. They could not accept the donation of that land. I mean, that is breathtaking. That, I mean, that is, that is like, you know, the punch in the chest. But, and, and so actually in early 2022, off the Sawbill Trail, we accepted it. Basically, it was a, effectively a donation of 35 acres that really should belong to the uh, Superior National Forest. And it was, it was super complicated for us with various encumbrances and, and the like, but we took that on as a way of, of, of public service. And when the time comes when the Superior National Forest has the capacity, we'll convey it to them. But the, the, capa the problem goes much beyond that because there's, there's other land that's making generational changes. I mean, right now, this is the single greatest transfer of land in U.S. history. There's a generational change. People are passing away. The next generation is trying to make decisions. And so you'll have a generation that passes away. It'll go to a handful of siblings. The siblings can't figure out what to do with it. And it goes up for sale and it's developed. And we know some land should be developed, but some land should not. And that land that should not be developed is not, the, the Superior National Forest can't protect it. And so uh, in this case, in, in, our, in, our, in our landscape here, the Nature Conservancy delivers its mission in a different way. It's the biggest, best national conserva international conservation organization around. But it's not, it's not here to, it won't protect those sort of lands. But the way it delivers its mission differently here on, on restrictions, conservation easements on large timber properties. That's how they're delivering their mission there. Uh, the Minnesota Land Trust, which does great things on, on, on uh, restrictions, on conservation easements on private property, that, that tool doesn't work. That's only if you want to keep your property, you put a restriction saying, hey, we're not going to develop this part of it. And so uh, as an organization under the leadership of, of John Penshorn and our board, we have made a decision that we'll become involved selectively on land conservation to protect land that has high conservation value, important for habitat, important for clean water, important for scenic resources. And so in 2022, we began that, uh, that, uh, that journey with that, that first property off the Sawbill Trail, but then we bought 80 acres on Snowbank Lake with over 3,500 feet of undeveloped shoreline right next to the wilderness area, right adjacent to it. And it's a beautiful, there's a wild rice bed by it. It's beautiful habitat, both aquatic and terrestrial. And so we are buying that for the conservation values to protect it for the next generation. It was all done with private donations, all done with private donations from individuals just like you. And, uh, and then uh, this property here, this is uh, the South Coastry River. Uh, just two months ago, we bought over 360 acres on the South Coastry River. And so it has two and a half miles of undeveloped shoreline on it. You know, great, great lowland habitat, you know, just uh, 
just a, a, a beautiful piece of property. And we did it because the family has making that generational change. The Superior National Forest could not, could not, uh, uh, could not act on it. You may have seen the recent news that they're involved. It gets into the weeds, but the, the buyout of the state school trust lands. And so that is a small cottage industry in and of itself. And it's been that since 2012, this whole churn. And that's an important thing. But, but you know, that land is, is not going to be developed, right? You know? And so they're involved in this process, this process, this process, this process. Meanwhile, when property like this is, it, it can, be, can be cut up. And so, it, you know, it, it's, it's not for us to kind of, you know, in, engage in policy change for the Superior National Forest at this point. It's our, it's our job to act. And so we acted. And so now we protected uh, approaching 500 acres um, uh, of the wilderness. And it, for, it, it will it'll be publicly accessible. So there's some edge habitat for grouse hunting. People can go in grouse habitat. They can canoe and, and use the portages. This property has uh, three portages that lead into the, uh, into the wilderness there. And so we're providing, we're a nonprofit providing this important public service through land conservation as part of our wilderness pillar. And we pay taxes. And we pay taxes. Yes, and, and we pay taxes. That, that was another part of that. Thank you, thank you, John. That's part of our, our belief, you know, how, how we understand there's a whole lot of public land in Cook, Lake, and St. Louis counties here. And that, uh, and that erosion of the tax base or the lack of a tax base is a real problem for the schools, for everyone. And so uh, we built in that we'll, we will pay property taxes. So we use private funds to buy it, and we're using private funds to pay the, to pay the taxes each year. And then uh, wildlife conservation and climate change. You know, this is um, Lee Freelich, uh I know he spoke here earlier this year. Did he go through the climate change yep. presentation? Mm -hmm. yep. and, and you know, for those of you that were there, there's one slide in particular that's really, really striking. And it's one that he has of uh, the boreal forest after a, a really warm, early warm day in kind of the late winter, early spring, where all the, the pine trees were really stressed and they turned brown. Brown, 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 and uh, Lee Lee says like you know if you have two of those seasons, if two years in a row of that, all those trees will die from here to the Hudson Bay, and it's like wow you know climate change I thought was something like like this where you know the frog is in the water doesn't know it's warming up and you know finally the, the frog gets boiled, but that's not really how climate change works and that's that's how a lot of things work you know that okay things are going like this then there's a step up and, and the world has changed the world has changed as we know it and uh and that's the case with climate change and we really need to to uh be prepared to deal with it i mean it's um uh, it's not uh you know it's not a point of debate now now the superior national forest its forest management plan was last updated in 1993 so the 10-year plan, you know, is now a 30-plus year plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is extraordinary. I mean, you know, and, and so that what we will do as, an, as a nonprofit, we cannot implement those policies. Really, it's the public land managers, the Superior National Forest, but uh, DNR, which manages the lakes and the boundary waters, as well as the uh, uh, thousands of acres outside the wilderness, those are the primary public land managers, along with the county land managers, that, that can implement policy. But what we can do as a nonprofit is really, really direct policy and really drive it. And so by this time next year, we will have a, a wildlife conservation director on board that will be dealing with assembling all the information, all the research on climate change affecting the arrowhead into one place. Because right now you have uh, Lee Freelick over here with the boreal forest. You have a woman, Gretchen and Hansen, over here that deals with, with uh, the, the lakes. And then you have the loon expert over here. You have the moose collaborative over here. And they're not, they're not speaking to each other. And, and uh, this, often this research can be super opaque and there's not sort of that inter interdisciplinary work at hand. So knowledge is power. So we'll have the repository of all the research that, that's out there that's been done identify the gaps and make it accessible to the public as well as professionals. So that way the public can, can have a handle of what's going on and understand the nuances and the complexities of climate change and how you know certain lakes will be affected but certain lakes over here won't be affected. That are microclimates within the wilderness where there's certain cold areas that uh, within the wilderness that are 
that uh, will be will last. And so, so these are the things that we'll do to to really protect the wildlife conservation to make sure that the landscape does support the habitat, uh, the, does support the wildlife that, that we've been accustomed to uh, over the last uh, century and a half here. So I'm gonna, now going to get into the clean water and some of our work here. And can you please hand me that? Jackson, thank you. The, the can, no, how about the can first? There we go. Thank you. So, no, the, the beer can. Thank you. Yes. So, so, I mean, this is, so it, we are a state where the, our, our, our flagship beer, I don't know if it's the best beer, but we'll call it the flagship, <laughs> it's a flag, from the land of sky blue water. I mean, I mean, this has been our heritage. So we, our heritage as a state is clean water. I mean, we have 1,200 lakes in the boundary waters. We have the greatest of the Great Lakes, Lake Superior, that has 10% of the world's fresh water by surface area. And we have the headwaters of the Mississippi River. I mean, we are truly the land of sky blue water. And when we think about our heritage and this whole debate over sulfide mining, what, like, what is our heritage? Our heritage is this, clean water. And, and that is, in, in the years to come, clean water will be the most important natural resource that's out there. And you know, this is some clippings I took of, of different headlines. There's practically a headline, you know, certainly every month, if not every week. You can look at Mexico City having problems. You can look at the Southwest and Arizona and Colorado. You can look at, uh, at, uh, at parts of Europe. I mean, clean water, I mean, it, 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 this is the resource that we need to protect. And when you're sort of blessed with the bounty, you often don't recognize what you're blessed with. And so Minnesota is, is blessed with clean water. And this is what we need to protect. And, and folks all around the world here, you know, uh, down in the, the Mississippi River, you know, where the, 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 the salt water is creeping up the Mississippi River here. Uh, I mean, this is just all throughout the, the world. Clean water is the most important natural resource. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the, the mines specifically that are out there and the uh, exciting progress that we've made to, to uh, uh, in stopping them. But there's, there's uh, two. There's, uh, there's, there's uh, the Twin Metals Mine uh, by Ely here along, along the South Kawishri River in, in this area here. This is the South Kawishri River. This is Birch Lake leading north. And I don't know where's, where's our land on there? First? Yeah, I know. I was, okay. I, was, I was going to try to get the pointer work. I don't know if I can get the pointer work. Shape work. Ah, there we go. We've got the pointer working. So this is uh, this is land owned by Twin Metals, and a, uh, and a little background on, on Twin Metals. It's owned by a big Chilean company called Anafagasta, and Anafagasta has a terrible track record around the world. I mean, it's been involved in dewatering. Uh, water in, in various communities and throughout its, its home country in Chile. And so it's owned by Anafagasta. And so although we call it uh, Twin Metals, really think of Anafagasta. That, that's the owner here. And so they own all this land here and, and are doing exploratory drilling here. Our land that we protected, that, that beautiful South Kawishri River property is right here. Mm -hmm. They also own land, we're actually neighbors. Twin Metals owns the land right north of us. So. Mm -hmm. So we are, we're in a tough neighborhood there. <laughs> we're in a tough neighborhood. There. And, uh, but there's been some exciting progress here, but there's a little Swiss cheese in it. So uh, what the, uh, you've heard the Biden administration did some important things to, to protect, to protect uh, the boundary waters here. And they did two important things. First, Twin Metals have been playing games with its leases. They, they originally these leases uh, uh, were, were, were 10 year leases that were uh, given in 1966. And then they were renewed, they were renewed, and they were renewed. And then they finally came up for renewal again. And then uh, the Obama administration did a scientific study and said, look, the cost benefit doesn't work here. And so the leases were not renewed. And so uh, that was reversed by the Trump administration. And then in, uh, in 2022, uh, uh, President, President Biden canceled those leases that Twin Metals has. So those are federal leases on, on federal land. The second thing uh, uh, in 2023 that the Biden administration did is on this land outside the wilderness, uh, federal land here, about 225,000 acres of federal land, not state land, not, not, not privately owned land. 
it, it, uh, it removed, it effectively placed a 20 year moratorium on, on sulfide, new sulfide mining leases. So this was recognizing that the water outside the boundary waters actually flows into it. And, and so those were two important protections. But there, there are, it's kind of a bit of Swiss cheese here. Uh, the first part of the Swiss cheese, again, it only applies to federal land. So uh, uh, right now, the state of Minnesota is still, uh, is still giving out exploratory um, permits to Twin Metals. And, and here, right along the same body of water, they were drilling this past winter and continue to drill. They actually continue to have one right there as well. You can see it when you drive down the road. And so that's part of the Swiss cheese. The, the other part of it is that these 225,000 acres only apply to the Rainy River watershed. And as we know, when we go over the height of the land portage from north to south lake, there's water that flows the other direction into the, the Pigeon River, into Lake Superior. The, the moratorium does not apply to that. And so there's, there's a, you know, is an important advancement, but there are, it's a little bit of Swiss cheese and those are the holes. And uh, I know that uh, 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 Dave and Nancy and Ben aren't here, but one of the things we do is that we really engage people at the state capitol and are, and are out there meeting every day having real conversations with elected officials. We had a Boundary Waters Day at the capitol and Ben Seaton, you recognize him, came, came, down, uh, came down for that and was one of our speakers. And, uh, and really, you know, I'm something of a talking head and a lot of, a lot of folks that are professional conservationists can become that. But the, the voices of, of young people, the voices of, of, of people in the community, these, these voices are so powerful. And if you want to become part of this movement, this, uh, it's not just a moment of time, a clean water movement with us, please let me know and, co and come down and be part of it because you are so effective and, and, and uh, speaking from the heart and you, that emotional connection really, really can move elected officials. I'm gonna get, get a little into like what the future might hold here. Uh, you may have heard about Project 2025. This was the blueprint uh, by uh, a, a, a nonprofit think tank called the Heritage Foundation. That is, it's a 900 page document that has the game plan for the next Trump administration if that were to come to be. And so this is what, it's really important for, for administrations to have policy makers and, uh, behind them. The Trump administration did not have that at, at, in the 2020, uh, 2016 election. But they have it now here. And it's this 900 page document. And on page 523 of that document, it says that they, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of almost a double negative. Abandoned withdrawals of land from leasing, including the Boundary Waters area in northern Minnesota. So what that means is that they're going to, they, we, we had what the Biden administration did, they withdrew those mineral leases, the, the potential for future ones, essentially a moratorium. So they're saying we'll, we'll reverse that moratorium affecting the boundary waters. And so this isn't black and white, this is, this is the game plan. And if there's a second Trump administration, they are gonna be ready on day one. So that moratorium will be, will be, will be flipped like that. So this will be, uh, you know, this is, this is not, this is not a, a hyper, per, hyperbole. This is, this is looking into the future. This is, this is what will happen. Chris, can, can you just touch on copper nickel versus taconite? Yes. So I don't know if everybody's on the same. Page. Yes, yes, on that. And you know, I had a, a slide to that effect. And, and you know, the, uh, this, is, this is the time to get into that. Yes, and part of my, my dog and pony show uh, right. on this. So, sorry, so, sorry. so we have this. So let's start, let's start with this one here. So, so thank you, Jackson. So we have this. These, these are, I have my, uh, my nails in, in peanut butter jars here. This represents iron. This is taconite mining. So this is, this, uh, it's been used a few times for so these, these nails are getting a little worse for wear, but here you hand me the, the water, the, that one there. So, so this is this is the difference. So, I mean, if maybe some of you have actually gone swimming in an old iron pit, you can do that. You can do that. So, an old iron pit, when you mix water with with uh, with with iron, with taconite, this represents taconite mining. You get rust. That's what that's what you get. But copper nickel sulfide mining is is, is much different. And so when they talk about the heritage, we do not have a heritage of copper nickel sulfide mining in Minnesota. And so I will kind of use this as uh, a, a dog and pony show here. So this is, these are Jackson's marbles here. I have, there, there are 300 marbles in, in here. The actual copper and nickel in, in the ore bodies that we have here 
is represented by this one marble. Hmm. So this is the waist. This is this is the copper nickel. Hmm. And so what you have in this is you have sulfide that's mixed in as part of the volcanic rock here. The copper and nickel, when the magic of the world happened, you had sulfide mixed in with that copper and nickel. And so what happens when you expose that to water, water plus sulfide gives you sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And that's what you get. So you have sulfuric acid as part of this process, and that's different from taconite mining. And so what you get when you have all this waste, again, it's, not, it's over 99.5% waste. So when they say, ah, oh, you should call a copper nickel sulfide mining, I don't know. You have all this waste here. You, you, know, this, it's, you know, it's a sulfide, sulfide product. And so you, know, you mix that in there, and why don't you pour, pour that so we can show what we get there. <laughs> Great assistant you have there. Yes, <laughs> yes. All right. Got a, a full, a full pond here. That's perhaps uh, a, appropriate for that's well. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, so we, want, we don't want to pay for the cleaning bill for the carpet here. <laughs> but, but, so this represents the sulfuric acid. So this represents the sulfuric acid. And so I mentioned that there were two mines out there. The second mine is is Polymet, and that's a little further to the south. It's actually primarily in the the Superior. Uh, Lake Superior watershed, but it's now proposed for expansion. It'll actually cross over into the Rainy River watershed and have the, dis the, the uh, notorious distinction of being able to pollute both watersheds. But Polymet's design is that they would create a big hole in the ground. It would be the largest permitted destruction of wetlands in Minnesota's history. And then it would create a toxic lake of 900 acres of this. And what they would do is they, they would take dirt, the tailings, to hold it back. And if you please bring the Statue of Liberty here. There we go. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you so much. That earthen dam would be as tall as the Statue of Liberty and would have to last 500 years. Wow. Would have to last 500 years. And, you know, very few things have been around 500 years, certainly not our country yet. And, and so th this illustrates the business model of twin metals and of polymet. The basic idea is that they're, they're shell companies with no real assets other than this mine stuff. And you, you bankrupt it. You bankrupt it basically when, when the ore is depleted. And so that's the game plan. That's the game plan is you have this. Yeah, the, uh, uh, they were going to put money aside, but they don't put the money aside in, uh, until really year 10 of operations, where the, when the liability is over a billion dollars. And so who all pays for that billion dollars? Well, everyone in this room. Everyone in this room. That's the business model. So you have these corrupt companies. Glencore was fined two years ago $2 billion for its corruption around the world. I think, uh, let's see, was it uh, Mike here we are talking about? Who was, he had me that right back there about, about their operations in the Democratic Re Republic of Congo, Zaire. What, the, what Glencore would do, he would actually send officials around with suitcases full of cash and bribe and bribe them, bribe people. That was how they operated. And that's the company that we want here doing this dangerous work with this with this uh, financial house of cards here. I mean this is just makes no sense at all. This makes no sense at all. And this is where it becomes an interesting political game. I kind of given you a preview of what the uh, what a Trump administration looks like. And I'm going to put this here, Bill, so I don't get hit with a, a carpet cleaning bill. There. <laughs> but it, but it's this that in, that uh, I'll go through kind of an interesting set of slides here um, that shows part of the issue that leads up to uh, Governor Walz. And so uh, I mentioned the, the the four tools that we have: litigation, legislation, citizen action, and political action. And so we are. Our, our, the bill that we're working for at the state level is called Prove It First. And it, it really is based on a fundamental question, has this ever been done safely? Has copper nickel mining ever been done safely? And, if, uh, and until before Polymet or Twin Metals could operate, they'd have to point to an example where this type of mining, copper nickel sulfide mining, has been done safely for, for 10 years without polluting uh, before we do it here in Minnesota. 
And so it really focused on the environmental harm. I mean, you think, boy, you, you know, if this is so safe, there's got to be an, an, ex an example where this has been, been done in a way that hasn't polluted. And, and if they can't make that, that point of, uh, of uh, if they can't make that, that showing of proof, then we can have that dialogue saying, okay, we are going to have this pollution of the Boundary Waters and Lake Superior, but we think it's worth it for these various reasons. And you've, you've, heard, the, you've heard the argument saying, well, you know, people will hold up, I don't have my cell phone on me, they'll hold up the cell phone saying, boy, you conservationist here, you know, you have a cell phone with copper and these other metals in it, and you, you, you're hurting the effort to, we need these for, for climate, to, to deal with the clean energy economy. Well, there are more than 10 mines out west that can supply the copper that we need for that. And so that's, a, that's a, a red herring, that's a canard out there. So that's a, not a, a real argument. That's an argument that's being put forward by, um, by the, the, the mining interest in order to move ahead with this house of cards that's based on these questionable financial, um, would, would be not, not questionable, based on a, a financial situation that puts all of you on the hook to pay, pay for that, that cleanup. Well, here's the, the interesting thing about Prove It First. Again, it's kind of a common sense legislation that was in effect in, in Wisconsin for 20 years. So we, we didn't like, we, it, there's a track record here. We see, kind of pulled it from something that had worked in the past. And we have lots of legislative supporters here in the Minnesota Senate. And we have lots of support in the Minnesota House. So there are 201 uh, members of the Minnesota House and Senate uh, altogether. And we have over a third of that that supports this legislation. But we've not been able to get a hearing. We've not been able to get a simple hearing on this. And the reason for this is that we are dealing with some of the uh, entrenched interests of the Democratic Party. And, uh, and Governor Walls and the Democratic leadership, they've been blocking a hearing even to have a discussion on this. And so, uh, and so uh, Governor Walls is may very well be the vice president. So it's an interesting conundrum for us as, as an organization to uh, our the sort of motive our, our, or the uh, motto would be that we want to push the envelope without pushing away. So it's a very delicate dance of, of trying to bring people to this as opposed to pushing, pushing away. And so, uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're in the, the process of getting a, a majority of, of, the, of the Minnesota legislature that supports this. And so um, we're doing it, doing the, the, the sort of boring work that goes on behind the scenes. We're talking to legislators one-on-one. -on -one, and most importantly, we're talking to members of those districts, citizens just like you. You are really the voice. And they, you know, they'll listen to you more than they'll listen to just a, a spokesperson for, for an organization. And so that's the challenge that we have here. You know, this on, on the legislative front for clean water, a very toxic industry, foreign mining conglomerates that want to come into Minnesota with uh, uh, a financial, with the financial risk that's borne by the taxpayers. I mean, this is, this is the reality. So this is the, the battle that's being played out here involving the wilderness here, in, involving the wilderness that, that, that you love here. And we have lots of we're lots of supporters. We're, we're trying to reach out beyond the sort of enviro conservation groups. Hungry Jack Outfitter is, a, is one of the supporters of this Prove It First coalition. Uh, we're reaching out to faith-based organizations as well. So if you have a, a business and want to support this, or if you're part of a, a, a church and want to be part of the uh, uh, Prove It First coalition, we're trying to really create a movement. This is, this, hap this is a way of building it over time. And this is where we really get things up. Um, things pass because of this, this broad-based support here. And so, uh, together we can, we can uh, change the future here. I know there's a picture of Jackson here from, from yesterday that was going to be here, but, uh, but it uh, did not make this version. I tried to change it this morning. <laughs> it didn't, yeah. so. So, but, but really, you know, when I think about what we do, we're, we're doing it for, for the next generation and trying to, trying to pass that on, that we've been blessed with so much and that we want to leave the world better for the next generation. And we do it through community people and, and wilderness advocacy. And some, ah, there we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. Jackson. There we go. And, uh, and, you know, we did not catch any fish, but they want to hand me. I, I, I told, you know, often with younger kids, you want to do top water fishing, the bottom water stuff always seems to get tangled. Anyway, 
when we went out on Friday, it was not a good day for fishing. <laughs> it was not a good day, uh, not a good day on Saturday either. So we came back on a good day, and so we really didn't get fishing. I've been telling Jackson that a whopper plopper is great for topwater fishing. You don't have to be an expert at all. You can these small bass just bite it like crazy, and you know. So this makes me uh, an expert at catching uh, uh, smallmouth bass, smallies here. Uh, but, you know, even if I had a, a, a tackle box full of these, you know, if we have polluted water, we're not going to have the fish, and I, I could have all the whopper ploppers in the world, and it won't make a difference. And so, protecting our clean water is important for, for anglers and, and for everyone here. And there are some examples of, of ways you can become, put a few dates on the calendar here, I've got a couple here. Uh, for those of you that Want to go to the state fair with with uh, you know 100,000 of your closest neighbors or so? <laughs> we will be at the state fair, having conversations with people, having a whole lot of fun. And uh, we have a it's a little late in the season. We'll see how the weather goes, but we have a bike ride around the Twin Cities, uh, a 50 mile bike ride, uh, starting at a, a cidery called Minneapolis Cider. And then finally, we have our annual gala, our dinner on October 19th. And so uh, we look. For those of you that can make it, for those of you that haven't gone, you know, uh, south yet here, it'll be a, be a lot of fun. Uh, Keith Ellison will be our keynote speaker mm -hmm. at at the, at the gala. Uh, Keith, our, our Attorney General, uh, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, is developing a, a, a clean water initiative for the state, and so he has, and he was actually a guide for uh, for youth groups in, in the Boundary Waters as well. So he has a real love for the Boundary Waters. Um, we have, yeah, here, thank, thank you, thank you, and then. Uh, and then uh, we'll also have as a guest speaker Jessica Hellman. She's the executive director of the Institute on Environment at the University of Minnesota. And the Institute on Environment, commonly called INE, INE has been a leader in doing a lot of, a lot of great research into climate change. And so she'll speak to the importance of that. And then finally we have a, a, our conservation award is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Crown, one of our, our major donors to our efforts to buy the South Cushery River property. So it'll be a fun program, an engaging program and uh, it'll be uh, a really great time. And uh, there's some music behind this, which we cannot hear. And I, I want to thank all of you and have, before you do some Q&A, a, a couple, couple, couple giveaways, right? I was about to remind going to remind me here. So, yes, and so, yes, I had forgotten in the past. So we've got a few things here. Jackson, what do we have? Wait, wait, oh, we have it over here. Got these over here. It's already here. All right, let's see what we've got here. <laughs> No. Okay. So, let's see. Why don't we start with this one? Um, anyone with kids or grandkids got this? So, any would imagine? Well, oh, some of you. Raise your hands, please, please. Okay. Well, okay. We have this. So, this is the this is the journal that we give to students that go out on on the no boundaries to the boundary waters trip. So, it has these sort of various prompting uh, questions and comments to lead to to real reflection on, on the trips here. And so, so uh, maybe the first question, we'll start off with an easy one here. How long is a rod? Somebody raise a hand. 16 and a half. 16. Okay, here, here we go. Right there. Oh, there you go. There you go. You get that. Okay. There we go. Start with this one. Okay. What year was Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness founded? 76. 76. Okay, 76. There we go. Maybe hand that one over, Jackson. <laughs> All right, thank you. There. I have more of those than I can use. More of those? Okay, then thank I'll tell you what. Uh, do you play cards? Occasionally. Occasionally? Okay. We have a special Boundary Waters, uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness uh, uh, card deck here. It has lots of interesting animal graphics on it. We'll get that. Do you want, how about that instead of a water bottle? Okay. All right. And then this is sort of, it's kind of maybe the, the grand, grand prize thing, the big question. So we have a, a lot of this. We have a little stainless steel mug that, uh, uh, you can use for drinking the beverage of your choice. We have a deck of cards here. We have a koozie. We have some uh, lip balm here. <laughs> we have a little patch. You can sew a patch on here, and then a, a, a little scoozie for your for your dog or for for your nephew. So, so this one, 
Um, how many lakes are there in Minnesota? There are more than 10,000. So how many lakes are there? We can, we can go like high, low, getting close. So, so 12,000. 12,000. 13. Oh, actually, actually less, actually less. So less than 12, less than 12, more than 11,000, so. 11,700. <laughs> close, close. Uh, another, a little. 11,800? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll tell you what. 11,842, so yeah. You get, you get the grand prize here. You get the grand prize here. And, and if you want, we've got some, some more things. I, got, I brought a few shirts here, and so you can, there's a shirt on the back. If you want some shirts, just, just come by. Yeah, the, the gentleman with the, the hat and glasses in the back here. And so, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for that fun here. I welcome the conversations and, and questions and thoughts. You know, I, I appreciate your thoughts and, and suggestions. If you have, so we'll bring a, a person on board here that'll be based in Grand Marais to work up the trail, Grand Marais, kind of going along the North Shore. You know, think of things up, uh, think of things that uh, that person could be in, involved in. You know, activities and that. Yes. Um, I'm representing the Cook County Coalition of Lincoln Association. Huh. As your person communicating with our people, we are not. We want to talk to that person. So Great. Well, that we're. Water quality monitoring on many of the lakes and up and down the trail and the sawmill and the Pyramid. So we covered Pyramid County, a lot of which is abutting the inbound waters. So we need to be able to communicate. That's number one. Number two, the Pyramid in the state has always been a problem jobs, jobs, jobs in the economy. Doesn't make any difference which party is there in the state house. Republicans or Democrats, they listen to the range. Right. And the rangers. And the need for jobs and <clears throat> the contribution that that makes to um, the state of Minnesota. I took a RB is a good example of how it affects us up here. Um, Sure, sure. Well, could, thank could you. you repeat the question because we're not picking it up for the folks that are. Sure, thanks. Uh, I'll repeat the question as best I can. Correct me if I can get it wrong, but there's two main points. One is working with the lake associations is really important. They're an important constituency and one that is really involved in water quality and that we need to be connecting. And, and that I, I so agree with you and I so look forward to our, when we bring that person on to have that. Uh, have that communication. I view lake associations as being, you know, one of those important vectors into the wider community of people that love love the wilderness, love and, and understand the importance of clean water. And then the the second point is okay, the uh, about jobs, 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 and and that and that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, that this is a, a mantra that's on there, and that the Iron Range constituency is saying you got to have these mines for jobs. I think there, I think here, here's where we need to change the paradigm, and here I'll tell you where here's where politicians are are playing people against themselves, and and I truly, I, I am I am truly upset about this because I'll tell you I have a uh, my background is I grew up in northeastern Ohio, and that is where LTV was based, and I remember when LTV went bankrupt because I was I actually marched in the group to try to keep that LTV steel mill operating. Because if it were to close down, it's a, it's not a, it was a blast furnace. It would have been done forever. And so, so I very much, I did not quite understand the connection, uh, the full connection to the Iron Range up here, but I understood the importance. I come from the industrial heartland, understand the importance of steel. Ohio is the largest auto producing state in the, uh, in the country, largest steel producing uh, state in the country. So that's fundamental to who I am. So it's very important to me. It's also the city where the river caught fire, right? And so we know that as well. We know that as well. So here's what the, the unemployment rate in December of last year in Cook, Lake, and St. Louis County was between 2.2 and 3.1 percent. Between 2.2 and 3.1 percent. We do not have a job shortage in the state. We do not have a job shortage in Cook, St. Louis, and Lake County. We have a worker shortage. And, and I, you know, I come from a city that lost about about 800,000 people, a county that lost 800,000 people over, over, over a four-decade period. So I understand the depopulation concern. So when I hear the Iron Range talking, 
all that all that resonates with people. They, you know, where they have those hyphenated school districts saying, oh, you know, whether it's Chisholm or whatever, you know, Mount Iron, whatever. It resonates with me. And the politicians are playing those people off. I mean, everyone, who can be against 300, you know, good paying jobs with union benefits? No one. But, but what's going to happen with these, these, these mining companies, they're not going to hire local. The, the skill set and, and, and that, it, that these people require, it's not going to be that many jobs, and most of them are going to come from abroad. You know, and it's just not going to be there. With automation, it's just not going to be there. So they are totally deceiving everyone. And that's where Amy Klobuchar, Tina Smith, and Governor Walls are really failing us. I mean, our population in the state, well, fell a year and a half ago. It's up, it's up now. I know what it's like to come from the lower Midwest where you had a population decline that goes over 50 years. I mean, I, I, I know buildings that are three football fields long where people play paintball games in them now as opposed to making things. So I'm a believer in the industrial heartland. But what Governor Walls and certainly what, the, unfortunately, the Republican Party has is completely abandoned real, real policies. We need to support a broad-based small businesses, entrepreneurship, creativity. I mean, that's where that small business drives our economy. And you know, and it, the the large corporations are able to get through the Republican leadership and the Democratic leadership, and able to get those corporate goodies. And so. So when you think, so when I think of supporting the gateway communities, I want them to be thriving and, and prosperous, and that includes a whole lot of things. It deals with substance abuse. It deals with the housing shortage. It deals with those sort of day-to-day -day things. You know, having access to uh, health care, and I'm not just talking about health insurance. What happens when the dentist leaves, right? Or where you don't have an OBGYN, or you have to drive three, three or three hours. I mean, those are things that are real, and I think those questions about the economy, you know. You know, if you talk jobs, 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 that's what Amy Klobuchar, Tina Smith, Governor Walls, any Republican candidate talks about. But they're not talking about how to make thriving communities. And so, so I think it needs to be talking about thriving communities and make that work. Because, because they're, they're really deceiving between 2.2 and 3.1 percent. And if you've had to do any repair job on your cabin or your house here, you know it's tough to get workers, right? So. Yeah, question. No, sorry. So I'm, no, I'm, don't yeah. mind me. John, John yeah, Penshaw, yeah, yeah, board member here. Um, if you think about some of the most pristine uh, natural places the place in, the, in the United States, they've got communities that are supporting people that are recreating. And if you were to propose projects that would cause devastation, you know, in, in Rocky Mountain National Park, the residents of Estes Park would say, no way, you are not taking down our livelihood. And so, Having that sponsorship for wilderness in the Arrowhead, you know, and having thriving businesses that are involved in people recreating in the Arrowhead, that's what's involved in this vision that Chris is laying out. Okay, thanks, John. Thanks. I found your monthly uh, Zoom informative meetings. I found them very valuable. Please share how people can get on that. Sure, thank you. Uh, out of the pandemic, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic was trying to reach people uh, on a regular basis uh, where we're not all in the same room. And so we developed these monthly Zoom meetings called called Lunch with the Friends. And so we just had uh, one the the other 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 week here on a, a climate change issue uh, on on Thursday. And so uh, if you can you can email us and say. Please have me on on our email list, and we'll, we'll update you on on uh, um, to to get uh, access to our our free lunch with the friends programs that we have each month on a, on an interesting topic. So so thank you for that prompt question. He, yes, he may be talking about the, the community committee. Oh oh uh, oh you know that this is another. Uh, uh, I think he's maybe talking about the lunch with the friends, but but we're also having something else that Zach, your question also prompts another in, important. Thing that we're doing, um, we understand that you know uh, certainly we have are expanding our staffing up north here, but but that uh, we we have the the sort of uh, at least perception of being hoity toity Twin Cities people that come up and tell the world what to do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so as we engage with the communities, we were established we've established a Boundary Waters uh, Communities Committee that it meets uh, uh, four times a year, meets quarterly via Zoom, and we actually have one coming up in a, in about within the next two weeks here. 
And, uh, and so uh, we bring people together from, from Ely and the Gunflin Trail and Grand Bray to talk about issues that are important and what the friends can do. And so it's our way of being truly responsive, knowing that we really uh, don't know what the communities need and how to engage. And so this is where we get information on how to connect with the com uh, communities. And so I envision that we'll, we'll do probably over the next years have a have a, a, a Grand Marais Gunflint Trail. Uh, uh, bless you, bless you, John. There uh, committee, and then an Ely committee, and then one that comes together and talks about things across the the breadth of the Arrowhead there. And so, so we meet meet quarterly on that. And if you want to be part of that, you know, I actually have a, a stack of my cards there uh, on the table. Just just email me, and you can become part of the. Um, part of our Boundary Waters Communities Committee where we have these conversations and, and look for real engagement uh, on, on these issues. And then separately we have these monthly Lunch with the Friends Zoom meetings on topics of importance that uh, we had Stu Ostoff, uh, uh, an angler that does a lot of work in the Quetico, talk about right around fishing open. We, we have a breadth of things and we talk about the uh, other science-based issues as well. Yes? I'd like to make a couple of comments on the supply of copper in the rural markets. I mean, we produce it Montana here in the United States. They do in Canada. And the biggest supplier is really Southern Africa. It's Zambia and Katanga province in, in uh, Congo. And I spent 35 years in that area. I'm very familiar with it. They do an open pit type mining down there. They don't do any of this deep shaft mining. And this is the area that has a, a lot of more potential producing copper, but there's a problem involved in it. And it's called corruption in the governments. And the United States government has got programs trying to help the Zaire or Congo and Zambia to clean up that act. But when you got Glencore in there, you know, bribing in the funding arm of military coups and stuff like that, that really makes it tough. So what we need to do is to be able to help Zambia and, and Congo to improve their governance so that we can have more production. We don't have to. Doing this little mine up here in Minnesota will do nothing for the world economy for man. It'll help out company, but it's, you know, as far as where the copper is going to come from, it's Southern Africa. Hmm. Yes? So given your stated position on access and support for local small businesses, what is Friends' long-term vision regarding motors in the back Sure. You know, right now. You summarize uh, it. Oh, question. sure. The the, the question was, uh, what's your position about motors in, in the in the boundary waters for the future of that? I mean, right right now we understand that there's been a compromise struck on on motors in the wilderness, and that this is a, a compromise that was 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 fought hard in in the 1970s, and we're comfortable with the the compromise that's been struck. You know, uh, I I will for those of you that uh, uh, operate tow boating services. You know, one thing I like to to think about is. You know what the future might be in a way of, of 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 where that might be. So what if you had electric motors that could could operate, you know, where you wouldn't have gas powered that could still supply those services with uh, while also having less impact on, on on the wilderness. You know, I I have the uh, um, you know I do have uh, uh, and so that's sort of uh, our, our position right now is looking at ways. Rec uh, to improve the wilderness experience while we'll recognize that there was a compromise struck um, on this. And so, you know, there are other organizations that advocate for an outright ban on, on motorboats. And, and, you know, uh, the sort of what you do and how you do it as well. And, and the advocates of that have, haven't really um, reflected that there are real people that are impacted by that and, and, and haven't really internalized that. and. And, and, and to me, I, I realize that real people are, are, are affected by, by that and that this compromise was struck. I, um, so, you know, I guess that to answer your, I, I understand uh, the positions on both sides and this is where we're at right now. So, yes? Does uh, save the boundary waters go on both, so, both sides of the border? In other words, does it extend into Canada and at the Botico and uh, uh, you reach across the border with your program? Uh, sure. Thanks. Thanks for your for your question there. The the question is uh, as two part. One is uh, do we do work in, in in Canada? And you also mentioned there's uh, our, our organization Friends of the Boundary Waters uh, does does work uh, uh, broadly. We, so we do the people, community, and wilderness protection work. There's another organization called Save the Boundary Waters. That's actually a separate organization. And that or, how that organization is different. Its its focus is just on stopping the Twin Metals mine. 
And so we're broader as an organization. Uh, mm -hmm. That's actually a program of an organization called Northeastern Minnesotans for the Wilderness. And we work hand in hand with them in, in stopping twin metals. But our work is broader in, in that we stop, we're working to stop uh, polymet because we're concerned about Lake Superior as well. And then we do the education work and our community work. So that's how just Save the Boundary Waters is a separate organization from Friends of the Boundary Waters. And there's all sorts of confusion between the two. And then the question is, the, uh, the fundamental question is, do we work in, in Canada? And you know, interestingly, we really haven't. And, and here's kind of an interesting challenge for us. I mean, we have sort of a limited staff and we're trying to make the best bang for the buck. But there are about, those of you that, that do outfitting into the Quetico probably know, there are probably, what, about 15,000 visit, visitors in the Quetico, you know, give or take. It's about 10% of what we have in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And about 80% of those are actually U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so, so it really, the Quetico is kind of a, a, a United States park, or, you know, a recreation area. And so, so there's interestingly not as big a constituency in Canada for the Quetico as you might think. There's a little bit, and there's some folks in Toronto, but really, really the consistency for the Quetico is here in the United, United States. And so I know there's, uh, and, and so when we try to advocate for protecting the wilderness, you'd think like, hey, Canada is downstream from all this. They would be concerned about this. But there's also a lot of uh, the resource, uh, uh, the mining interests are very, very well entrenched in Canada. And so there's a lot of support uh, for copper nickel sulfide mining in Canada. So, so really our, our best bet is to have U.S. citizens advocating uh, for the wilderness. So, yes. An online question uh, okay. from, from Kent Olson. The first part you already addressed, but so will you go on record that your organization advocates retaining the towboat and motorized use compromise? You know, what we'll, we'll, we'll be doing in the upcoming year, there's going to be an update to, to the forest management plan that'll have a lot of dimensions to that. And so we will be developing a formal position as part of that process. So what I'm kind of giving you is the my position that I have internally that I've had with John and, and others in, in talking about this. And and so it'll be it'll be part of that uh, that process of dealing with the forest management plan uh, uh, as as part of that. So that that's what so it's. Uh, you know, I'm not saying don't quote me on this, but I guess I'm saying don't quote me on it right now. But I'm telling you is where we're at as an organization and thinking about it, and we'll develop as part of that as part of that formal process that's that's that the that the forest is is working on there. Let's see, yes. Two part. How are you primarily funded to buy prop to buy the land and to to do all of your activities? And part two, what can an individual besides writing a check do? to help Friends of the Boundary Waters. Sure, great. So there were uh, two questions. One was, uh, how are we funded as an organization and what can people do uh, to help our organization? We are uh, more than 90% funded by, uh, by individuals, just like you. So, so that, is, that, that is how we were able to buy the South Coishree River property. There are a number of people in this room that were generous to help, help uh, fund that. And that's how, uh, that supports our general operating as well. We get some public money, important public money, that helps with our education program. But that, again, the bulk of it, 90% of it is from, from individuals. And the ways of, 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 of helping us, aside, aside from writing a check, we, that, that citizen action part is, is so important. So if you are willing to, to write your, uh, if you live in Minnesota, uh, uh, your Minnesota legislature saying, hey, I support, uh, I support protecting the, the boundary waters from copper nickel sulfide mining or these other issues, uh, that would be, be really important and be part of that network. Uh, you saw Ben Seaton there from Hungry Jacks uh, came down and uh, uh, it was actually Valentine's Day. He came down on Valentine's Day when he had showing the love of the Boundary Waters on <laughs> Valentine's Day. He uh, came down for that. So communicating, again, uh, if you're uh, willing to, you to write letters to local papers as well, you know, that sort of outreach is, is really important. So we're trying to develop a citizen action network of people that are engaged at whatever level of commitment they can make, you know, aside from writing a check. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. You know, I, I, I know that the, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but I'm going to stick around for a while. Son, grandson Jackson will help me here. We can uh, answer some questions. And I want to, again, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, John Penshorn as a board member. I want to thank uh, Mark Hennessy as a former board member. And I want to thank all of you because uh, we're all in this together. We all love the wilderness, and this is how we're going to protect the <coughs> wilderness for 
Jackson. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Just a small aside, because you had the ham spear. Yes. <laughs> you know, the commercials were filmed at Chickwalk. Yeah, oh, that's right, that's you right. Know, two and a half miles from <laughs> yes, here. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so you could build that into the... <laughs> there we go. You need to have, you know, I, I, I read that.